Hey there, so we are going to continue on in chapter two with Father Mitch Pacwa's How to Listen When God is Speaking. And this section is about pursuing eternal life in heaven. You can find it on page 30 if you're following along in your book. Let's start with prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hearts May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts be in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. And O oh, Blessed Lady, spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pursuing eternal life in heaven. After resolving to love God above all things and integrating his desires for us into all aspects of our lives, our next goal is to avoid eternity in hell and to pursue eternal life in heaven. That may be so obvious that it sounds strange to have to say it out loud, but we need to say it. Fifteen years ago, a young woman sitting next to Father Minchpaqua on a plane explained why she left the Catholic Church and started attending a non-denominational church. The priest at my parish was always preaching about hellfire and damnation, and I wanted something more positive than that. Father Minchpaqua was shocked, to say the least. Where was, the, where was this priest who preached about hell? The only sermons in which we hear today, and we had ever heard hell mentioned, um, are very few, right? <laughs> we don't hear priests preaching like that anymore. Father Mitch Pacwa says here, I've, I had the, the only sermons in which I had ever heard hell mentioned were my own. Although the lady later admitted that the priest did not always preach on this topic, I began to think, how her criticism was a frequent one from both Catholics and Protestants alike, and how that criticism had led to a death of sermons about hell. Then I realized that the only public depictions of hellish conditions come not from the pulpit these days, but from the movie theaters. Hollywood now charges 10 bucks to portray horror, mayhem, and terror, it's a little more than 10 bucks now. <laughs> it's a lot more. Even outside of the horror movies, some characters on screen will snarl, I'll see you in hell, right before shooting their victims. Unfortunately, in real life, I have come across a few people who seem to sincerely want to go to hell. I remember a young man who hated his parents way more than he loved God. He hated them so much that he said to me, I'm going to hell and I'm taking them with me. Less extreme than his positive hatred, but more a common attitude, was reflected by this woman's statement. I know the things that I'm doing will bring me to hell, but I do not want to stop doing them. I do not think I can stop, so I will end up in hell, and that's the way it is. Still others flaunt a life of sin with no concern for their eternal future. In fact, they insist that nothing they do is wrong to begin with, no matter how self-centered it is. Because of these attitudes, we would do well to make it clear and explicit. Getting to heaven and avoiding hell is one of our highest priorities during our existence on earth. Jesus is warning about the consequences of sin. Many people falsely assume that everyone goes to heaven. Movies are made that way, even based on this premises. The thinking is that no one ends up in hell because God is too loving to send anyone there. But who talks about hell most often in the New Testament? Not St. Paul. As some would assume, um, St. Paul, right? Because he was murdering Christians. So surely he would know. But no, it's Jesus himself. Read the Sermon on the Mount and note how many times Christ warns about ending up in Gehenna, calling a brother a fool 
while being angry with him makes one liable to judgment. And you can find that in the book of Matthew 5.22. Failure to make up with an opponent can bring one to a spiritual prison until the last penny is paid. And that's Matthew 5.25-26. Not only adultery, but even looking at a woman with lust can drag one down to hell. Matthew 5.27-30. Furthermore, many of the parables about the kingdom of God in Matthew 13 warn about the possibility of being cast into the fire of judgment. The weeds are burned and the wheat is harvested. And that's 13, 24 through 30. The good fish are kept and the bad are thrown away. 47 through 50. In the last set of parables in Matthew's gospel, there's an unfaithful servant whose severe punishment in Greek literally means being cut in two. And that's Matthew chapter 24, 45 through 51. The five foolish virgins are left outside the wedding banquet in the darkness because Jesus never knew them. And that's 25 verses 1 through 13. The servant who hid his one talent and cast it into outer darkness for failing to use that talent. That continues in chapter 25. The goats who do not help the least of their brethren are sent off to eternal punishment. That continues in 25, right? And nowadays, it's cool to be a goat, right? You're the goat. You're the greatest of all time. It's like, eh, I don't know if I want to be a goat. In these teachings, Jesus makes it clear that spending eternity in hell is the most serious consequence of any sin that a person can commit. Not public shame, not life imprisonment, not torture, not even the death sentence are worse than damnation. Hell does not permit the fellowship of sinners. The misery of hell does not love company because love of any kind cannot exist in hell. There are only hatred and disgust with fellow sinners who have so martyred, uh, marred the image and likeness of God that they can find nothing in themselves or in, in one another that is loving enough to love. See, God is love. And where you have no God, you have no love. The community for which man was created is inherently impossible in hell because of sin's lonely individualism, right? It's all about me. It's myself. Myself, myself, myself. Well, just think about what you love the most as far as self-pleasing. That would be your torture in hell for all eternity, all by yourself. No joy, no happiness, no pleasure just torture. How does thinking about hell help you become a better person? Is it not possible for making avoidance of hell the center point of evangelization can make a Christian morbid? So is it not possible that making avoidance of hell the central point of evangelization can make a Christian morbid? After all, have, many, have not many Christians so focused on hellfire and damnation that they drove many decent people away? Well, fear of hell has certainty be, certainly been useful to, he says to me, particularly in those times in my life that I avoided certain sins because I was, not because he was virtuous, but because he didn't want to go to hell, right? And I mean, think about the opposite. Why do we do some of the good things that we do? Because we want to go to heaven, right? Some people are like, well, we shouldn't be reward driven and we shouldn't be this. And it's like, well, but we're human. And the majority of us, we're making good choices because we want to go to heaven. We want to be with God for all eternity. And the same can be said for hell. Like we go, ooh, I can't be involved with these people because I know the temptation to sin is too great. I don't want to go to hell over that one thing. I don't want to lose my state of grace for that one opportunity that could tempt me to do that. That's not the best motive, but it works just fine sometimes, right? <laughs> yes, it does. I'll start off with that in the hope that someday I will see the real advantage in the virtue that is behind God's commandments. In fact, if fear of hell were the only motive preventing a would-be murderer from committing the deed, I could live with that, and so would the victims, right? The motivation 
isn't the end result. The motivation is what helps you make that decision to make a good choice. While fear of hell is not a bad motive to help us avoid sin, it is still not enough to sustain a life of virtue and joy, right? Because if we're just being motivated, that's an exterior reaction, right? There's this exterior source that's motivating us, motivating us. And if that motivation doesn't come from inside, it's not going to sustain. So temporary, you're, you're being temporarily motivated to do something good because of a little reward. That's not going to feed you for a lifetime. But building those virtues do because you see a whole plate of cookies and you go, eh, I'm just going to have one. Eh, what's another one? Eh, what's another one? And then before you know it, you've eaten a whole plate of cookies. So you have not practiced the temperance, your, your virtue of temperance. But if you do just eat one cookie and go, you know what? I'm going to practice virtue of temperance today. I'm going to have that one cookie and be pleased and just be happy with my little pleasure. I don't need the whole plate because by the end of that, I'm going to be sick to my stomach anyway. And then you, you know, it's just those little bitty choices to bring that virtue in your life every day that really do help you avoid sin. The reason is that the fear and avoidance of something negative like hell will not sustain our motivation to pursue the things we do want. We end up reacting passively to experiences rather than striving to achieve these goals. This helps explain the temptation of the third servant who received one talent but simply hid it out of fear of losing it, right? Fear of loss. Everybody hears uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. You don't have to have FOMO with material items, but you definitely want to have fear of missing out when it comes to sin and life and hell for all eternity. That's the one FOMO you want in your life. <laughs> so if you hear FOMO, that's what it means. Fear of missing out. This, let's see... But yeah, this helps explain the temptation of the third servant who received one talent but simply hid it out of the fear of losing it. He ended up condemned and cast into outer darkness precisely because of his cowardness. And this is in the uh, book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 24 through 30. Often an avoidance of evil or a fear of condemnation and failure leads to an overbearing and harshly judgment approach to self and to others. How many people so fear negative consequences that they cannot see the joy of doing God's will or the peace of practicing virtue? Such people are the model for negative portrayal of religious hypocrites so often depicted in popular media. People also need a strong positive desire for something good and beautiful. Human beings are created in God's image and likeness. So they have an innate urge toward his wonder and the adorable qualities that are his. Only one eternal destination can offer people fellowship with God and true communion with the people we love and who love, whose love is return. And that is heaven. A positive goal, powerful salt with intense desire will make it possible to take great risks and engage in in the great adventure of our faith. Only in this way can we understand the parable of the treasure hidden in the field and the pearl of great price. And that's Matthew 13, 44 through 46. When a person appreciates the tremendous value of the treasure or the pearl, he takes the great risk of selling everything he possesses, trusting that the treasure and the pearl will still be there when he can actually acquire them. The saints have had such a desire for heaven, both for themselves and for others, that they have been willing to travel to foreign and remote lands, enduring suffering and persecution, and even being martyred or put to death. So, we definitely want to think about this today. There's a lot of great scriptures. So, dive into the book of Matthew. Let me see. It's a nice chapter. We'll stop there for today. We'll continue on. There's another little bit, Desiring the Wedding Feast. If you want to read on through that today, you can. Um, let's see. It's just a little bit. Let's do it. Let's do it. Desiring the Wedding Feast. 
Scripture contains many images of heaven, such as the wondrous descriptions of the joys, beauties, and feasting of heaven in the book of Revelation. The same parables of the kingdom of God in Matthew allude not just to eternal punishment, but also to the rewards of eternal life awaiting those who serve God faithfully. One of the most appealing images of heaven for me is Jesus' description of heaven as the sun's wedding feast, to which many are called, but few are chosen. And you can read this in Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. For Father Mitch Pacwa, he's a Polish-American. Weddings were always a fantastic fun. While the church service was solemn and beautiful, the wedding party was loud. Two polka bands had to take turns playing so the crowd could dance into the early hours of the morning. There were always huge servings of food served family style since most of the guests were family anyway and relatives in the hundreds including my great grandmother Zosha or Zoshaya I don't know how to say it I'm sorry I butchered it but it's beautiful and 20 or more great aunts and uncles I remember playing all night with my cousins those weddings are still among my favorite memories from my childhood I could imagine such celebrations going on for all eternity. Christ's parables and St. John's visions set before us the goals that God wants us to desire. Eternal life and joy and light with God, the angels, and the saints. We are taught to look forward to witness, witnessing the infinite mystery and beauty of the Blessed Trinity. But one All Saints Day, I received an insight. Our role in heaven is much more than as an observer. While mediating on the readings, while meditating on the readings of the day, I was trying to imagine the joy of seeing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the full majesty of their love for one another, their complete giving of themselves to each other. That seemed like a wonderful vision, much the way it is a great joy to see parents and babies looking at each other's eyes with a sparkle of joy, or a couple obviously in love and taking delight in each other's presence, right? Or that high school, high school teenage love. You know how they look at each other and they're like, hey, and they look, hey, it's just, it, it, you're just like, they're so in love. They have no clue. <laughs> they're, they're so in love. <laughs> then I was given another grace to imagine the Lord God turning his face toward us in infinite and unconditional love. Not only is this the infinite love of the persons of the Trinity for each other, but for us as well. We humans will have the opportunity to share in their loving gaze. This will be like being the child or the lover who was loved with tender approval and affection for all eternity. So it's the complete opposite of hell it's think about that time where you felt the most love in your life and expand upon that and it's the greatest amount of love that you could ever feel forever forever such a wonder motivates me to strive to be with our lord in heaven and that goal is a very basic principle that enables us to discern what God is saying to us in this life until we do reach our forever home. So that ends on page 36. If you, I highly recommend going back and reading through this. Um, there's some amazing scripture references. So you start at page 30, Pursuing Eternal Life in Heaven, and read through page 36. And we'll talk tomorrow about accepting God's revelation in his, on his terms. Um, so that's that. That's a lot. That's a lot to chew on. You could chew on that for a month. Seriously. And then has fear of going to hell ever helped you to avoid a, a, a particular sin? So has fear of going to hell ever helped you to avoid a particular sin? Is it the main reason you avoid sin, fear? Because again, scripture says we were not created to be fearful, right? We're not, we're not supposed to live in that place of fear because fear is actually the opposite of love. 
God created us for love. Or are there other reasons that you avoid sin? And if there are other reasons rather than fear, make a list of them. What are those? And just sit in that. And then you can even sit and think about how does imagining what heaven is like helps you to grow for desiring it. You know, like what do you picture heaven looking like? How can you shift from being fear of hell to desire of heaven and focusing on the po positive? You know, like that woman said, we don't have to focus on the negative. The negative is there. It's a reality and we still need to talk about it. But you don't have to sit and focus on it 100% of the time of the day. But just like your house, your house is kind of picked up and cleaned, right? It's picked up on a regular basis. But you still have to deep clean and go into those dirty cracks and corners and get all the dust bunnies and get all the dead spiders and bugs and whatever out of the windowsills. Like you still need to pay attention to those things because it's necessary for our growth. It's necessary for cleanliness. It's necessary... Um, in so many levels. So we're not going to ignore that hell exists and our world is making a mockery of God at every turn and making hell like it's not a big deal. It is. It's a very big deal. Don't buy into the lies. And let's focus on desiring heaven, which is love forever. Close the prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Virgin Mother of God, we fly to your protection and beg your intercession against the darkness and sin which we evermore envelop the world and menace the church. Your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, gave you to us as our mother. As he died on the cross for our salvation, so too in 1531, when darkness and sin beset us, he sent you as Our Lady of Guadalupe on Tepeyac to lead us to him who alone is our light and our salvation. Through your apparitions on Tepeyac Hill and your abiding presence with us on the miraculous mantle of your messenger, St. Juan Diego, millions of souls converted to faith in your divine Son. Through this novena and our consecration to you, we humbly implore your intercession for our daily conversion of life to him and the conversion of millions more who do not yet believe in Christ. In our homes and in our nations, lead us to Jesus who alone wins the victory over sin and darkness in us and in the world. Unite our hearts to your immaculate heart so that they may find their true and lasting home in the most sacred heart of Jesus. Ever guide us along the pilgrimage of life to our eternal home with him. So may our hearts, one with yours, always trust in God's promise of salvation in his never failing mercy toward all who turn to him with a humble and contrite heart. Through this novena and our consecration to you, O Virgin of Guadalupe, lead all souls in America and throughout the world to your most divine Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Woo! That was a big one. This is deep. So go back, read through those scriptures, open your Bibles, and really go in. Just pick one. Pick one of the ones that you're like, ooh, I want to read more about that and let the Holy Spirit speak to you today. So have a great one and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.